If you're in the market to buy land, this is a conversation you need to hear. It's with Joe Carter. He is a lender out of the state of Missouri, and we talk about a lot of different things that will be helpful for anyone that is looking to buy their second or third or fourth farm, or even their first farm. I hope you guys enjoy the content in this conversation because it is excellent. Get your notepad ready. Here we go. Joe, how's it going? Welcome to the Land Podcast. Uh, it's a beautiful morning in North Central Missouri. So, yeah, I got up at, I got up at five and finished up one of my food plots here next to the house. Love it. Yeah, that's uh, it's that time of year, man. It's uh, things everyone's everyone's really busy, and I appreciate you taking the time to sit down and record here today. And uh, it's you know, we got some good rains going on, and uh, brassicas are going in. People are getting all their food plots ready. Yep. Finally, I actually dug uh, in some uh, pine scrape posts the other day, and went about 18 inches down and it was wet all the way down so that's good huge. Fi- finally yeah we got about seven inches of rain about a week ago so wow yeah it's uh it's gone from one extreme to the next kind of feels like from almost no oh, rain for, for sure to a bunch but regardless it's good to get some moisture back in the ground and before we get into this we we're going to be talking about a lot of different things you're a lender um by trade in missouri so go ahead and introduce yourself uh, who you are where you're from and what you do yeah, uh, my name is Joe Cater. I live uh, in Randolph County, Missouri, Western Randolph County. Um, I've been in, I've been around finance my whole life. My dad uh, was a 30 years uh, retired bank president, so I was always kind of growing up in the passenger seat of his truck, learning about balance sheets and you know what to do and not what not to do. Dave Ramsey stuff, that kind of thing. Um, professionally, uh, before I got into banking, it was just kind of an opportunistic thing, but. Uh, I spent some time after college in the uh, corporate world, uh, international business machines, IBM. So I use a lot of acronyms because of that place. Everybody <laughs> makes fun of me at work for all of my acronyms. But uh spent some time there, um, spent some time in direct sales uh, in, in the insurance area, and then uh, Wells Fargo for about a year. And that's when the opportunity kind of came up to work at the bank as my dad was kind of working on uh retiring and then my dad and my uncle are both in the end our community bank here in north central missouri so gotcha. it's been really well it's been great yeah that's a pretty interesting journey there um ibm wells fargo is from big companies and then to, to go oh, yeah. to a regional bank is probably pretty pretty stark uh difference between the two of them yeah like uh it was just you know great to work with my dad his last few years uh as he was is uh, at the bank just he's across the lobby from me you know so it's great i got a great relationship with my, my dad because of that and um yeah it's just been a lot of fun so we actually were a small community bank um that merged with a larger regional missouri bank uh regional missouri bank is a good good solid foundation of other people in the north central missouri area so couldn't be more pleased with how that's worked out the last five years. I guess that was in the fall of 19. So Okay. Yeah. And so you mentioned what, what to do, what not to do, and then you, you said Dave Ramsey. So are you guys uh, more Dave Ramsey, or are you guys the, on the contrary of that? Because I, I, didn't, I didn't know to take that as you're pro that or, or maybe against it. So I just want to get your perspective. Certain people need to recover <laughs> using Dave Ramsey because um, I've, seen, I've seen everything – a to Z, you know what I mean? People with great balance sheets and people with negative balance sheets. So um, Dave Ramsey would not encourage buying a rec farm, probably too much risk. Yeah. Um, but if you're in a position where you can do it, there's no different than anybody buying a boat or a motorcycle, except for the fact that those are depreciating assets. Right. Yeah. So, and, uh, so yeah, I think, I think sometimes people who are really disciplined, uh, financially disciplined, it's almost like they have to get permission to buy a recreational farm because there's some people that think it's a, it's a waste of money or it's like, why would you spend all that money on, on a rec farm? And then to your point, it's something that historically has appreciated. So, I mean, even, even some banks look at those differently too. So I think, uh, it's always good to have a lender that understands recreational ground, understands the intrinsic value with that. And so, do you have people that kind of ask like, Joe, all right, well, I, I've been really thinking about buying a farm. I don't know if it's a good idea. What do you think? And then do you get those conversations? Well, yeah, a lot of uh, younger guys that, that uh, and I mean, older guys in this age is not really a, a material subject on that, but younger guys, mostly, you know, how do I get into this? Um, where do I start? Um, 
uh, the first thing, place to start is not have a giant truck payment, not have a boat, not have a motorcycle, um, all those things that are, you know, luxuries. I don't golf. I golfed for the first time two weeks ago for a buddy's bachelor party. Had to borrow my brother's spare pair. The last time I golfed before that was April of 2009. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah, and I'm a banker, and everybody expects bankers to do the do the golf tournaments and things, and that's just not – my prerogative at all so uh-huh. that's I, I bet you shot really well then too <laughs> it was a scramble and we played my ball three times at 18 holes so yeah. I, I did think a really nice putt but that was about it so uh, that's funny so uh, that those are those are really important things i think that's some that's some things that we talk about all the time but it's uh it's good to talk to a lender because you you see these conversations or you have these conversations every single day and so uh-huh. um it's always good to hear but I guess diving into it, a lot of, and you tell me, so I'm, I'm calling you up. I'm saying, Hey, uh, I'm interested in buying a farm. I'm not sure where I really stand or what I could potentially, uh, borrow. W- what's the first step? This three page document that I sent you, um, that's a personal financial statement. Somebody that doesn't know what that is or a personal balance sheet, whatever you want to call it, what you got and who you owe until you fill out that thing, you have no idea where you stand. Um, and there's areas on there for to add your consumer debt, your bank accounts, 401ks, any real estate you may own, any other personal assets, um, boats, trailers, trucks, that kind of thing, tractors, whatever it is. Um, and the main thing you want to know, assets minus liabilities equals net worth, pretty simple stuff. Mm-hmm. And so once that's you the get first... there, yeah, that's where you get to know where, you know, do I have equity in another piece of real estate? that I can borrow against in lieu of down payment, or do I have to have or need to pursue having that physical cash down payment? And so let's say, let's start with the cash down payment. Cause I think that's probably where most people are at versus, you know, they don't own uh, real estate to borrow against, but we'll get to that one. But so for someone that has, I don't know, 30, $40,000 in the bank, um, they don't have a ton of consumer debt. They have a mortgage. Uh, maybe they have a $500 student loan payment. And so that means that when, let's say their income is $60,000 a year. So um, we'll just do some really quick math on this. So 60,000 divided by 12, let's say they have a $500 student loan payment and then minus a $1,200 mortgage. So then they have roughly $3,300. And then what else would need to be deducted from that? Uh, The family living sometimes, depending on how many kids they have and things like that. Um, we don't count utilities. We use your net or we use your gross income. I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, from an underwriting standpoint, you want to take out taxes and insurance also on your debt to income ratio. Um, and you just basically, if, if you have a, you know, I'll call them a race car farm, people call them a race car farm. Um, even though they still are an appreciating asset, um, you want to make sure that your, uh, expenses, like those don't exceed, generally speaking, about 36% once you throw in that farm payment on top of the mortgage and the car payment and that kind of thing. So, so about 30, 36% debt to income is kind of what you guys shoot for. That's kind of what we shoot for. Um, certain, And of course, if the farm has cash flow, you can add that in pro forma, you know, if it's steady and reliable. Like one-time timber harvest is not going to be a recurring Payment, you know, uh, mm-hmm. CRP, cash rent, that kind of thing. Great. I don't like to use the other uh, numbers and things from uh, the equip and the CSP stuff. We'll get into that later because mm-hmm. you're waiting on the government. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Good enough for government <laughs> work. Um, but those, we'll get into that because that is something that you and I talked about that is not discussed nearly enough. Yeah, I know. Uh, part part of it, honestly, feels like it should be gatekeeped because it's such good information <laughs> and there's so, only so many funds. All you got to do is get the right team to guide you in that direction, whether that's you as a real estate agent, me as a lender. I have personal experience with it, um, which, I mean, mm-hmm. it's helped me develop so many good relationships with clients that are now great friends that, you know, I've got a lot of clients from Michigan, three or four different states here in the Midwest, Arkansas, you know, just that we keep tabs. We show trail cam pictures. It's all relationship oriented, you know what I mean? And and putting those people that have that experience 
on your team. I want that guy on my team. I want that guy on my team, you know, Um, especially somebody that's, you know, can make themselves available to you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited to dive into that. So doing the debt to income is kind of one of the bigger things. Is there anything else that is important or paramount for someone in the, in, I would just call it the due diligence phase of figuring out their financing or finances. Is there anything else that you usually ask or, or people should ask you? How do I save money, Joe, whenever I have this, this and that? Um, open up an account somewhere other than your main checking account where you can just hop on internet banking and transfer money over when you want to go spend money on something silly. Um, and just have that come straight out of your paycheck and deposit into the other bank, whether it's, uh, you know, whatever the deposit product is, um, a savings account, you know, a high interest bearing checking account. Some banks have those right now. Um, just so that you don't see that money, um, you get a little bit of interest on it, not much, but, um, and then there's always, you know, the envelope method, you know? Yeah. So my little thing is every time I want to try and save up some money for a redneck blind, I shove it in an envelope. That's just what happened. That's just, that's just what I do. <laughs> the system that works for you. Yeah. Yep. I, I, I totally agree with that. I think for most people, the automation, like automating that savings mm-hmm. is, is really easy because it's, uh. I almost think it's human behavior. Once you have a little bit of coin and then you start looking at stuff that you really don't need, like, ah, oh, maybe I want to upgrade my truck or maybe I want to, maybe I want to get this or that. And it's like, do you really need it? Depending on what your goals are. I mean, if you want to do that, that's fine. But automating the process to where it's out of sight, out of mind. And then you are building that nest egg, I think is the, delete the best the Amazon, approach. Delete the Amazon Prime app on your phone. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I was just thinking the other day, of how much time though on the on the positive, how much time Amazon does save instead of having because I live forty minutes away from Walmart or wherever else, and so it, you know it saves me an hour and a half each way, basically a two hour trip. But I definitely buy a lot more stuff than probably what I need. Yeah, because it's still it'll show up in two or three days, and it's just like, oh, oh I forgot I even ordered that. <laughs> yeah, dude, Prime Prime Week was two two weeks ago or whatever it was, you know, and it's just like. I have a trail camera on my driveway and I was like, Oh my God, another one, another one, another one, another one. So, but, uh, anyway, that's, that's something, uh, just really narrowing down your consumer debt and things that, you know, what's most important to you, you know, don't number two, a couple of different things. Don't, don't buy a motorcycle because two years or two wheels put people in boxes. My grandfather taught me that he was a funeral director. Um, and boats are money pits. Yeah. So, um, if you like fishing, go grab an eight hundred dollar kayak or whatever it is. You know what yeah. I mean. Yeah. So get a, um, get a John boat off Facebook and a trolling motor. <laughs> right. Instead of a three hundred dollar boat payment that you only use four months out of the year. Yeah. You know, for or sure. whatever it is. So it so. sounds like the the biggest the the biggest deterrence for most people is likely consumer debt or or borrowing for depreciating assets. Right. Uh, Well, that and then, you know, some people will tell you not to borrow against 401k retirement plans. Um, I got a real good friend, a client that uh, was like, you know, and he's trying to buy his first home, just for instance. And it's either put 20 percent down and have private mortgage insurance or how do I and he had he had cash laying around for the 20 percent down. He's like, Joe, I don't want to go make myself cash poor. But he's got uh, whatever the retirement plan is they have through the Boilermakers Union. He was able to borrow against that at like one percent interest. Mm. I was like, uh, "Well, that's way better idea at doing that than paying thirty, forty, fifty dollars a month for PMI until you pay that loan down to eighty percent loan to value." So yeah. that was he, and he put some cash, at physical cash, down, and then he borrowed a little. He was going to borrow a little bit against um, his uh, retirement plan, but that's that's another avenue that someone you know. You know, I don't recommend doing that if you don't have to, but it's something to consider. Uh, just don't get rec- don't get reckless with it. And he wasn't, you know, borrowing a whole lot. It was just you know, ten twenty grand. So yeah. And so how that works, I assume, is let's say he borrowed twenty grand against that. You just pay back that twenty thousand. I assume probably from your paycheck. Your employer probably repays that from your paycheck, mm-hmm. and then until it's yep. repaid, and then it, you know, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, one percent interest anywhere right now is pretty dang cool. <laughs> I guess that does it. That does Especially when it's in a retirement fund that's going it's up. Free, it's free money. You know yeah. what I mean? 
Yeah, um, if it's if it's going up yeah, nine, ten, eleven percent, and you shave one percent off of that to get you in a house, we hope or five this year, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah, for sure. Okay, well, th- those are really good things. Any any other interesting tips before we dive into like structuring payments? Because I think that's something that we haven't talked about before that uh, was pretty unique how you laid it out. Yep, go for it. Okay, so this is uh, this is interesting because I think that a lot of these different farms, a lot, typically there's some form of CRP or cash rent. I mean, uh, there's I would say the the pure tipper track is, um, I would say probably less than. 10 or 15% of what most farms that are available for sale, if that makes sense from just from what I've seen. So anyhow, you're talking, you laid out how to basically lay out an irregular or hybrid payment schedule. So what, what the heck does that mean? All right. So I get a check in uh, October 17th every year when everybody that does that gets a CRP payment um, that week or whatever it is. Um, So what I've done for clients is set up, a principal only payment on November 1st, you know, after that, surely that checks hopefully come in from, from the FSA. Sorry, there's my acronym things. FSA is a farm service agency. That's who pays you on CRP. Um, and then put that towards the principal balance, fully amortize the loan over 20, 25, 30 year term, whatever it is. And that will decrease the money on your monthly principal and interest payment that's coming out of your personal cash flow that subsidizes that farm payment. Mm-hmm. And so, like, so like a, yeah, yeah, walk that through one. that example. Yeah. Let's so this one right here, uh, this fella was borrowing 240 grand when rates were four and a half percent back in 21, whatever it was. <clears throat> and he gets about 14 grand in CRP, uh, and I don't know why I have this on set for March, but let's just say that it's October or November, you know, that $14,000 pays down the principal and then that minimizes his uh, monthly principal and interest payment to $330 and 74 cents, which is huge because let's just put that number in my little calculator here real quick, 240 grand, right? Mm-hmm. At that point in time, when I had that template made, it was four and a half percent interest on a twenty year note. Guess what that number is per month fifteen hundred and eighteen dollars so he goes from a fifteen hundred dollar a month payment to a three hundred dollar a month payment three thirty three thirty of course, if you annualize that, it's still the same yeah eighteen four fifty but you're yeah but but it's a different, it's a totally different thing from your personal finance standpoint because you're coming up with $300 a month instead of $1,500 and then you're waiting for that one payment to roll in. And I, I just have to imagine for most people, that's far easier. Dude, it's just like, you mean to tell me that this farm is only going to cost me $330 a month, Joe? And they look at me and I'm just like, all it is is changing the payment schedule, okay? Now, you want to make sure that you... Spray your cerise less but easier and keep your sprouts off your CRP. So the fellow over at the local FSA office looking in the, at the satellite that's live streamed uh-huh. that you're doing, making sure you're just doing everything you're supposed to do. It's pretty simple. It does take some sweat equity um, or hiring somebody to do it, but make sure that you're doing that kind of stuff. And then yeah. as far as, and we can also do so on the cash rent side. So if you're getting paid half in the fall, half in the spring, on let's say 30 acres whatever it is where's the other sheet i had like so okay so this guy actually had he got a prorated payment one year so there was a single principal payment three or four months after booking the loan for three thousand dollars and then semi-annually on six one and twelve one of five thousand dollars okay Mm-hmm. So that moved. That one was only ten thousand. So he's paying seven hundred sixty dollars a month, as opposed to uh, let's see what that one was. Whatever it is, two hundred sixty grand. Sixty. The rate at that one at that point in time, of course. You know, don't. If I'm saying four percent rate right now, no one. This is this is purely for example. Okay. Yeah, these yeah, numbers so, are a little bit, little bit different now. <laughs> yeah, so that changes his monthly payment to from fifteen seventy five a month to 
to seven hundred and sixty dollars a month out you of personal to. cash flow. So, oh yeah, it's huge. Which is that, dude? That's a that's a game changer because we stick that in that debt to income ratio. I was just gonna ask. Yep. So in that, I mean, gosh, that. So when they when the neighbors comes up for sale or they end up wanting to get a different farm, that debt to income is based off of their monthly cash flow coming out. So like, would it go off that seven hundred? Mm-hmm. In that example, okay. So, I mean, it basically allows you to have more borrowing power or more saving power because you're able to stack, you know, let's say mentally you're prepared. Okay. I'm going to, this payment's going to be $1,500 a month, but, um, it's only going to be 750 because of the income and you can stack away an extra $750 a month if you already budgeted basically what you're planning on doing. Sure. So that's, yeah. I mean, and you know, me as a lender, you know, you don't cut a deal like this for everybody. You know, you got to have great communication, uh, a good cre- a good credit, and we don't look at you know. I don't look at everyone's. Oh, my credit score this, my credit score that. I look at trade history a lot more than what whether your score is seven ten or eight hundred or whatever it is. Because um, I can, whenever I pull that credit report, I can see everybody everybody's trade that you've had and however long you've had trade. We call it trade history. Okay. So what does, so, what does that mean? Trade history is uh, do you, how many 30 day past dues have you had on a silly credit card you probably didn't need, you know, or a truck payment, you know, one of the mainly, you know, and there's, there's reasons people don't have as good a credit as others with medical collections that didn't know about student loans that got sideways. See that one a lot. Um, and uh, a lot of times people's credit will get trashed somewhat because of things like that. And a lot of them are like hundred dollar medical collection, whatever it is can bring you way down, you know, um, and that's why I look at installment trade history more so than I would what a, just a credit score is, you know, um, and cash reserves is also a thing, you know, if, if something bad happened and you didn't get your cash rent contract renewed or something, is there a way that we can figure out how to get that payment stream going, but communicate with me on the front end, you know, as soon as you smell something like that, say, Hey man. We got to figure something out. I got to start making that fifteen hundred dollar a month payment instead, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's a good piece of advice there of just being honest and communicating with your lender because they're going to figure it out. Like they they have all the information on you. They can they've see the you see enough files where you can kind of probably understand trends or like uh, I've seen you know X Y Z a handful of times, and this this could mean it might mean trouble. So then, as a borrower, you just I think you just have to be brutally honest. Like this is where I'm at. Um, and right. to me, that's just the way to do it. Sure. Well, that's really, that's a, that's a huge, huge piece of advice to, to ask a lender, Hey, would you guys entertain a hybrid payment schedule? Um, I have income on this parcel. I'm trying to get my payment down a little bit lower. Do, do a lot of lenders do this? Obviously you guys do, but is this, is this I'm common sitting practice? Here- I'm sitting here giving away my part of my secret sauce, but <laughs> um, and not all of them do it. No, they don't. Um, I mean, I know a lot of lenders around, and there, there's there, there's ways to do it. Number one, you got to have a really good loan processor because I don't put these numbers in; they figure that out stuff out for me. Uh, there's not an app loan calculator out there that I'm aware of that you can that do does that. Yeah, they just magically do because it's a kind of a complex calculation. We have tools to do that, but, um, but yeah, it's it's something that you need to uh, pursue. And keep in mind, you know, I I can loan money for stuff all over the Midwest, so I'm always open to having a conversation with somebody and say, hey, I may not be the right lender for you on this particular deal, but shop around with your local your local mm-hmm. lender if that's not something that I can entertain. You know, which most what? of the time I can't. What states are you guys chartered in? Or is or I don't, oh, I don't I don't I can go nationwide, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So all over the place. So I you know, I'm doing a lot in North Missouri here. Um North Missouri, Southern Iowa is really where most of my my activities are. Uh, I've done a couple of farms in Kansas. Um so yeah, but it's it's fun, you know, seeing and hearing of course most of my buyers are uh, buyers or borrowers, I guess, are, uh, people that are after that, that recreational or combination farm for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. Which those are the, those are the fun clients to work with. Cause you have obviously a, a common. Dude, there's not, there's <laughs> not one of them I haven't developed a great relationship with. Right. Yeah. That's, um, that's the fun of it. 
that's uh, yep. in, 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 in my line of business too. That I, I, I take that. I don't take that for granted because you do get to meet so many people that have a same mutual passion and crazy. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and right. so, I mean, we talked, we kind of touched on some of this, but I just want to ask you kind of point blank. What advice do you have for first time land buyers looking to possibly finance a farm? And maybe we gear this towards where we're at right now, today, August 8th in the interest rate market, land market. I'm calling you uh, up. Joe, what do you got to tell me? Let's put together this thing right here. That personal financial statement, if you have, don't already have one, that one's super easy. All you do is put your – it's this Excel spreadsheet that we've got built. Plug your numbers in, and it calculates your assets and liabilities and your net worth automatically. So it's a, a pretty user-friendly, simple thing. Just follow through the schedules and fill it out. Get that to me or another lender, local lender that, you, that you've got a relationship with. And uh, last two years of tax returns, W-2s, pay stubs, that kind of thing pretty normal standard underwriting documents needed. And so that's that's step number one, because if you're not, if you don't happen to have that balance sheet, they'll support it today or the income, you know, we'll put a plan together, you know, get those team members like I talked about, whether yeah. it's with you or whatever lender they, they choose. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just, it's really that easy. Just get that, get that ball in motion and, then and communicate with your lender, man. You know, a lot of people are just like, Oh, I bought this farm or, Oh, I'm going to this auction when tomorrow. Oh, cool. Thanks, man. Well, thanks for the heads up. <laughs> I've been guilty of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, you know, and if you have a client that's talking about an auction, you know, make sure it's like, Hey man, look, well, says, guess what? Auction. Uh, I've been listening to this. You're going to close. Your other yeah, well, yeah. You know what I'm about to say? 10% yeah. down the day of sale. You better be ready. Yeah. And if, and if your financing falls apart and then all of a sudden you can't get the money, guess what? You lost your 10%. Dude, See ya. The, t the amount of times someone calls me up the day before an auction, I was like, well, hey, man, I need to borrow some money. I was like, oh, so I gotta, you're asking me to do a 90-day single pay note so you can scrounge it up your down payment. Like, no, we need to make a better plan than that. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. And, oh, and unsecured by that is what a lot of times they're asking for. I'm just like, uh -huh. dude. Come on. <laughs> so, okay. So the advice here is if you're going to an auction, call your lender, uh, not the day before, maybe uh, 30 days before to put together a game plan so you can move forward with confidence. Right. Well, and thankfully, you know, a lot of times when people do that, I'm already familiar with the farm because I put, uh, if a farm goes on for sale in eight counties in North Missouri here and in eight counties, six or eight counties in Southern Iowa, land.com sends me an email every day. So I, I know exactly what's out there and uh, not for that's myself personally, but for clients. And, you know, if I got a client just like you that, that's, that's looking to buy a farm, I'm like, hey, man, check this one out right here, you know. Yeah. So but uh, yeah. but yeah, that's the main the main thing is just, you know, getting prepared financially and wrapping your head around it. And then just like uh, I listened to your uh, podcast the other day with was it, was it Phil, I think. Yeah. With Phil, he was like, you know, after he got you know, his ducks in a row, it wasn't that hard. He just had to make the decision, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, that's yeah. He's, he was a prime example of doing, doing the best practices of, of laying out a plan and executing against it. And so this is, um, this is kind of just your opinion here, I guess two, a couple of different questions, but we'll ask this one right now. So obviously interest rates are really high in comparison to what they were even a year ago, especially two years ago. And I think people are looking at different loan products. And what's what's your opinion on arm loan? Because I know a lot of guys end up getting an arm loan for recreational land. That's just what I've seen a lot. I mean, what what's your what's your opinion on those? Everybody's different. Um, I'm in an arm on a couple of my farms right now. Is, does it scare me? No, um, because I watch every the rates every single day and. Um, and for people that are, that don't watch the rates every single day or are familiar with it, you got to just be able to have a conversation with your lender and, and have, you know, figure out, you know, do I plan on living in this or living in this or, or oh, owning this farm for more than a couple of years? Well, I got people that are like, I got a guy that's bought and sold like six houses since I've been in finance with him for eight years. And I'm just like, Hey man. And he just wants to get a 30 year fixed rate or a VA mortgage or whatever it is. I'm like, dude, well, you got the cash down payment. Why don't you just put you on a five year arm because you're going to move in ten days anyway, okay? But <laughs> right. um, or whatever it is. So, sure. um, but uh, you know, um, I'm going to five year on one of mine. I'm comfortable with it. Um, when did I'm when did that get initiated? When did that five year arm get initiated? 
I want to say it was last summer. Okay. It was last summer, and uh, going back to equity, I have really good equity in the timber farm I bought just a few months before that. I actually borrowed against it. Um, we can get into that later. Um, but I borrowed against it, so the 40 acres that I bought down the road with a family member uh, would remain free and clear of debt, so I just borrowed against my equity. Actually, when I had did originated the loan on the timber farm here, um, I told them, hey, go ahead and put the deed of trust, or in some states they call it a mortgage, for 75% of the appraised value so we didn't have to redo the title work and then file a new deed of trust at that time. So I was drop of a hat, just use the same appraisal we have in the file on the timber farm, and it didn't cost anything more than origination fee, basically, because um, all the title work and things were already in place. So mm-hmm. it turns you into a cash buyer almost, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about borrowing against a farm because we we talked about the down payment side of things. And then so what about for the guy that, let's say he bought a farm three years ago and uh, he bought it right and I don't know, let's say he has, he put 20% down, the market probably went up, let's say 20% roughly, maybe 25, 30. So let's just say for easy figures, he, uh, he has 60% equity. So he owes 40% on it. He, yeah, he... He owes 60%. He has 40% equity. For a guy like that, and let's say it's a, what's a, what's a nice round number you want to work with? Can we use my spreadsheet that I sent you? Let's do that. <laughs> let's do that. Because I'm not at my desk where I can just drop my, my formal desk where I can just drop papers in there. This is using a current home, okay? Which for a first-time farm buyer, that may be your avenue is by using the equity in your current home. Um, um so on this particular spreadsheet, current home, I've put square numbers. This may not be your numbers or anybody else's out there numbers. So the house is worth 500K, right? Half a million bucks, whatever it is. Um, the first, you see where that sheet where it says prior liens? Yes. That, that calculates it into the next line over total loan to value. So basically, the borrowing power is determined by up to 80% loan to value of that fa- of that home or farm, whatever it is, okay? Um, so then you add in your purchase price on your farm, which is called a half million dollars too. So sales price, 500000 Using the equity in the other farm, we're at $125K, all right? And then your loan to value is still about 75% or less, all right? So we're virtually financing the full purchase price of the farm. So, which, you know, your cash flow has got to be able to serve the debt, whether personally or by the, the subject farm. Um, but that's kind of how that works. It's just a, it's just a pendulum. It's just moving stuff around your balance sheet. You're going to have yeah. that, whether you have the cash down payment, you're going to have some debt against that farm. So, but we want the farm equity to be at 75% or less, and then the home to be at 80% or less. That's consumer versus an investment thing. It's and different banks or lending institutions might be a little different on that, but flexibility is key with that. So and like mm-hmm. and then you could go get really down the weeds and just talk about a line of credit if you're an investor too. So mm-hmm. how often do you see people borrow against let's say their primary residence by a rec farm? Is that a common practice you see? So I have some folks up here uh Macon County just uh, a couple three years ago. The they're retired folks, super nice. Um, rates were two seven five on a fifteen year fixed for a primary residence home mortgage. You know they were talking to another bank, <clears throat> and uh, they were I don't know what the rate on the farm was like five percent or something at the time. I can't remember what it was, but uh, they're like, well, they wanted to do this and cash down payment and blah blah. And I was like, let's fill this out, guys. <laughs> See where your equity's at. I mean, you don't have any money borrowed against your house as long as yeah, now. A lot of times I see one half of the relationship not being in favor. We just got our house paid off. We don't want to borrow against it. Not for everybody, okay? Mm -hmm. But the money was so cheap that it made sense, you know? Um, And uh, and so we, I didn't even touch the farm. No deed of trust or mortgage behind the farm. Secured it with the house. And you just roll on. Boom. You just, it's a, and just do it as a consumer home cash out refi, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, I, I have, uh, um, I have some family friends that they, they buy a bunch of different types of real estate, like apartment buildings, laundry mats, everything else. And they always joke, like, we've paid off our house four times now <laughs> because that's what they, it's always one of the cheapest forms of money. 
Why wouldn't you? I mean, I mean, if you have confidence in your balance sheet and your cash flow to make that payment, I mean, you're going to be making it one way or the other. What are you going to do? Sell a farm? Oh, yeah, that's what you would do. You'd sell the farm and pay off your house note and everything be fine. Yeah. So. Yeah. What? So, I mean, a lot of these examples, four and a half percent, two and a half percent, and obviously those days are behind us. And I remember uh, I recorded with a, with another lender out of Wisconsin, and this was probably 21. And I asked him, do you think we're in the golden age of interest rates? Because I felt that we were. And he's like, yes. <laughs> yeah. And so now that the golden age of interest rates are behind us and right. with with uh, what you're seeing, I mean, is there any word of caution for people or because obviously it, it drastically, drastically changes your monthly payment or a yearly payment, however you have it structured. I'm going to throw out a quick example. So I got a fella, um, super nice family. Um, they, he's got this equity in his house. I think he only had probably 80 grand borrowed against a 50 or $500,000 house, half a million dollar house. And he's been waiting, waiting and waiting and waiting for his neighbors to sell. Right. And neighbors were ready to sell 18 months ago. They were a little bit rich on the price is what he thought. So he sat tight and they didn't want to list it with a real estate agent, just their preference. Yep. And then eight weeks ago or whatever it was, Joe, neighbors are ready to sell the farm. Let's do it. I'm like, all right, man. Your annual payment just went from $31,500 to $40,000 on that, whatever it was. I think it was like, I don't remember how much money it was, but it was a lot, you know, a couple hundred grand at least. So that there alone, an interest rate change, he's like, man, I can't do it. I, there's no way I can do that. I'm like, sorry. I can't yeah. help you. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And, and just so everybody knows and say it louder for the folks in the back, lenders don't get special interest rates. I'm just letting you know that. <laughs> well, it, I mean, the, the financial institutions, like it's, uh, it's a very regulated space. I mean, uh, I've you have no I, idea. I don't, I don't, but I have enough to say that it's regulated crazy. <laughs> so my dad's, my dad's background before he got into lending, he was actually a bank examiner for the control of the currency in, in Kansas. Okay. Um, I was born in Salina, Kansas, but, um, out there, like he was, you know, he closed banks in the eighties, you know, that was the real thing, you know, uh -huh. but, um, but, uh, whenever the bank examiners come into the bank, guess whose loan files they pick first. The, the the people that work there. Oh, the lend the lenders and the executive management team, absolutely. Board members, everybody. Uh -huh. That's number one. So So that's that's, that's number one. So so you guys really, really, really have to dot all your I's and cross all your T's. Because oh, yeah. you're the you're the first to get checked. Oh, microscope, buddy. Yeah, I want to make sure you're not taking advantage of the system or anything like you know what I mean. So because yeah. there cause it does go on and it has gone on before, you know. Uh huh. So Okay. And it's, so it's interesting. Yeah. And so with that example of that, that potential client's payment changing drastically, I mean, mm -hmm. is there anything that buyers, people that are ready to buy right now, is there anything that they can do to, to, to hedge against anything? Or is it just, you gotta, you gotta ride the wave because that's what everyone else is riding. So I got a commercial customer the other day. He was asking me about, um, about CD rates. I was like, huh? Yeah, it's great, man. Oh, paying over 5%. We got this five month CD paying over 5%, whatever it is. Great. And I'm not, these are not exact numbers. This sure. is not my area of expertise on deposit products. It is paying pretty good. He goes, so if I put this in the CD for five months, what if I find a piece of real estate I need to buy that's actually making a deep, cause it's hard to find commercial real estate making a decent return right now. Just right. Is. Um, and that's why he put the money in the CD and I go, well, if you find something, you can either pay the penalty, which is not super significant, or I can cite the CD as collateral until it matures, and then you can uh, then we can put it down on the note if you want, or whatever it is, or main or just leave the CD and bump it on because guess what, he may be borrowing however much money, but that's so if he if we're let's just say eight percent, okay, on whatever his commercial real estate is right now, that CD is paying five, so on that amount of money, he's only paying three percent. Sure. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, I mean, that's something to, I mean, yeah, his loan balance is higher because that money didn't go towards the purchase price, but still, you know, that's just some, another way to, uh, secure, you know, a, a good return 
on something with a, with a, with a CD or a, a, when you're going to buy a farm, you can always cite that as security, you know? Mm -hmm. That's, that's an excellent piece of advice because I do think a lot of people are probably in that same situation where they're sitting, let's say they, they got fired up. They really wanted to buy a piece of ground and they have some money saved up. And then now it's sitting in an account and uh, it's not getting that form of interest. So do you think putting it into like a, a money market account or something that's a high interest parking it there while you kind of sit and wait for, to find the parcel that you, that you really like? I mean, sure. That's definitely not wrong, especially if you're able to negotiate a 90 day closing, if your CD is going to mature in 60 days. Sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah. Cause I think for that example, a five month CD, I mean, 90 days, that's three months. And so does, does that mean, you know, if you have, do you think you're going to find something the next two months? I don't know. <laughs> sure. I mean, and you might, and if that's the case, then we cite the CD as collateral, get the dang thing bought and then sort it out later. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good piece of advice. Interesting. Do you, um, I know it's funny. You met, you sent an email over on Monday, like, Hey, uh, this is my morning reading <laughs> and it's the Van Trump report. I've talked about on this a long time ago. <laughs> such, such, such a great daily newsletter. I love reading that thing every single day. And, uh, mm -hmm. and it's just one way to stay really informed because um, the guy that runs that is, has a, a lot of experience and a lot of really sharp people subscribe to that <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> when you find out. And uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that, that Monday uh, newsletter that he sent out about the Fed? Yeah. And interest rates it's so, not very optimistic <laughs> so we're we're skipping ahead right now but in my mind i don't think we're done seeing rates go up agreed and i was talking to uh, a great friend of mine this morning he's trying to hire some people to do some different things for their, his business and uh i said hey what do you want needing to pay these people or thinking about paying these people I, said, I don't know man it just depends on their resume this and that I was like, well, man, we're, you know, we're having to pay people more and everybody's having to pay people more and this and that. And he's like, yeah, that's why interest rates are still going up on huh? Joe. I was like, exactly. Because inflation and wages continue to creep. Well, and, and wages even so, because that's, we haven't caught up with that stuff yet. Um, the demand for, uh, I mean, good, good quality employees is causing people to, pay them more which in turn is making the interest rates continue to climb up and where they're not seeing the shock and awe to make the fed want to uh quit cutting or to start cutting rates just not going to happen mm -hmm. i thought i mean for, it'll be middle of next year i think before we see any kind of cut and we may even see some more uh, rise in the, in the fed funds rate yeah if, if i was a betting man i bet you the september fed meeting is going to have another raise by probably a quarter point <sighs> I feel I like it's almost already. I, hope, I feel like it's already baked in. I feel like it's already people are already conditioned. I mean, I've been following that very closely, and I, that's just my that's my gut feeling for whatever it's worth. Yeah, like I told you earlier before we got online, it's like at my other desk, at my desk at work, I have crystal ball. When someone asks me what they're going to do, I just casually <laughs> grab it from behind my monitor and slide it over to the on my desk. What do you think, man? You have a look and you tell me because. <laughs> <laughs> only the Lord, only God knows, you know? Yeah, for sure. Well, I think the, the, the bigger thing is you can only control what you can. And I know sometimes that feels, makes you feel a little helpless, but that's just the reality of it. Like you and I don't make any of those decisions and, and we're just, we're dealing with the same situation that everyone else is. And uh, like, right. Yeah. Just like, well, like for me, um, my, uh, my home mortgage, for instance, we were, we were building that, uh, this house. Did I cut out for a second? No, you're here. I'm here. Okay. We were building this house and my construction loan started back in, geez, July of 21. Is that right? I think 22. I can't remember. Anyhow, we waited around them for seven months on our dirt guy to show up. For whatever reason, it was wet, it was too dry, he was this job, that job. Anyway, he finally got here, we waited for seven months before I even advanced on my line of credit to build this house. And the whole time I was like, oh my God, I'm budgeting on 4% interest for my term financing. And we ended up like around six. But guess what that does when you're borrowing a couple three, couple 300 grand? Yeah. Like 400, Gee. four or 500 bucks a month, man. Yeah. You don't yeah. think I'd like to be paying down my farm debt or something else more than throwing it at this house, which I mean, yeah. 
you know, we and and we'll see a rates rate swing, and we might see five percent or four and a half percent in the next couple three years, and I'll refinance it then. But you know, I mean, it's just something that, you know, what am I going to do? Just keep paying my interest only note? No. So, but we we got it we got it done and, and settled in about four months ago now, and it's it's a dream come true. And we can get into that a little bit later if you, if we have time. So. Yeah. Well, I think uh, yeah, that, that's just a, a prime example of. It, it, you, those things are out of your control. I mean, it's just, mm-hmm. it, and I think the other thing there is, is creating some margin in your plan for, I don't, I don't want to say worst case scenario, but for a, a deviation of what you think could potentially happen. I mean, like you, you couldn't plan on the dirt guy, you know, having to wait seven months to do that. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I think that's, uh, that's important. So let's, um, and this, this is just another opinion. So, you know, I know your crystal balls at your office there, but, um, so like in your opinion, what drives the rec- recreational land market? Is it commodity prices like corn and beans? Is it timber values or, or is it simply driven from how good the economy is doing and the available, available cash and how cheap money is to borrow? Or is it all three? Um, four? That and emotional buyers. Um, just, I mean, emotional buyers, <laughs> sometimes that's what gets the rec farms going. Um, and man, so many people think about a rec farm and like, oh, I'm a hunting spot, but this and that and the other, and they're, they're 100% subsidizing it with their personal income. Um, people need to remember about those programs through the NRCS that will help you make money if you're willing to do the sweat equity. Um, but as far as demand for uh, the rec farms, location, neighborhood, the way that a farm hunts, if somebody's, that's what they're buying it for is hunting. Um, proximity to, and I'm in my market, St. Louis, Kansas City, Columbia. Because um, if you go down here to Boone County, okay, where the University of Missouri is at, 120,000 people in Columbia, you know. Um, just a just a lot, just a ten acre lot for a home site outside of Columbia. Twenty thousand dollars an acre, you know. Um, around here, we're looking at around ten because we're kind of an area where people still go to uh, to Columbia to work and things. But even a rec farm around here is four, five, six thousand dollars an acre. Um, and going back to that, like I had a client that sold a farm, had a client that bought a farm. For six thousand dollars an acre, it was a thirty-acre rec farm. They bought it for six, sold it for seven, and then another guy sold it for seven, two fifty, all within eighteen months. Okay, wow. yeah, and it's blacktop, and it's um, in, in one of the better small school districts around here. But an emotional buyer and someone that's recognized, and the, the final one that that ended up with it and presently owns it. Um, they saw the timber value and they were able to, they were actually a logger, um, but they were able to, and, and they're, you know, a guy that was around here that, that uh, was wanting to hunt and farm too, but uh, it's good investment for him and his family. And he was able to do the logging himself, obviously. Um, uh-huh. And really, really, really do okay. Maximize on returns. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. So, but uh, okay. So I, I've always found that interesting too. And, and I sell a good amount of houses as well. And you're right. There's emotional buyers, meaning that they think about raising their family there or uh, their grandson shooting their first deer on this farm. And so those are, those are different things. And then like a straight tillable piece is more of just numbers. And in yep. some scenarios, if there, I mean, there is emotional buyers for, for tillable and things of that nature, but a lot of it is just more pure investment. And even like the commercial buildings, some of the clients you're talking about, well, if I find something that makes money, it's just very black and white. Yes, no. Does this make sense? And that's the end of the conversation. Where like recreational farms, there's so many other nuances that goes into everyone's decision as it should. Sure. Right. And 1031 funds, don't forget about that. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. So. Yeah, I think uh, that's what created a lot of a lot of appreciation very quickly because from there was a lot of clients that I had that were doing the up like you know how people upgrade their house they they buy the the two bedroom one bath and they go to the three bedroom two bath and their family gets a little bigger and then they end up buying their quote unquote forever house and I think recreational farms can follow a very similar path of they buy the twenty or thirty or forty right and well I'm and, an example of that. Um, 
I bought a farm up in Macon County that I knew was going to be one that was more of an investment than me holding on to it. Um, but I knew I saw an opportunity. It came across my desk. Um, actually, a client was wanting to buy part of the farm, and uh, my buddy, that's the real estate agent on uh, on his buyer side, was like, "Dude, Joe, buy that 80." I'm like, "Oh man, geez, I'm building the house. Gosh, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right." And I ended up doing really well on it. I held it for just a little over a year. Um, uh, sold the farm. Well, I, I, so the timber farm here, 70 acres, been waiting on it. The lady to get a hold of me, I did everything. I've been talking to this lady for three or four years on this farm, even before I bought the CRP farm here. And, uh, the day that I signed that, con- got, we we're going to meet up to sign the contract for, for sale by owner contract. I'm paid a little bit more for it than I wanted to. Okay. It's pure wreck, no income a little bit of timber, whatever, not worth counting, you know, <clears throat> but the day that she, we, she, we agreed on a price, she gave me her price. It was more than I wanted to pay. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, yeah, you got to do it. Called my buddy. That's a real estate agent up in Macon County. I said, sell that farm. He mm-hmm. had a contract on it in less than 24 hours. Yeah. So we were able to do the 1031 exchange, got all that going. And, um, looking at it now, I paid, I paid market price for it maybe a little bit more, but that put me together at 240 acres here behind my house. So it's That's like, cool. yeah. what do you do, man? So, yeah. um, and I had, and I did really good on my 1031. So, mm-hmm. um, I think I ended up about a, almost a thousand dollars an acre more on what I sold it for than what I bought it for. And it was just a matter of circumstance, you know, it's just a mm-hmm. way that it fell into place with, um, my client buying the north end of the farm, the north 120, and I bought the south 80. Um, and the sellers were looking for a number, and we were able to do it with two contracts instead of one. They had it listed as one property. Sure. You know what I mean? So, uh, and basically, I made the pitch just all we got to do is sign two settlement, settlement statements instead of instead one. Of one. one. Yep. Yep. And that's, but, I mean, uh, that's a good, that's a good strategy or a viable strategy too, a lot of times instead of, uh, Instead of buying something with a partner, and I don't know that situation, but it's, I think sometimes people think like, oh, well, we'll just, we'll just buy it and split it 50-50 and be a partner. Well, in that scenario, if let's say you did that, well, number one, you wouldn't be able to 1031 out of that and buy the piece that you wanted because maybe they weren't ready to sell. And I think to me, that's the best strategy. If you have you have a buddy that wants to buy a farm together, like to me, just buy it into two and then... Well, and luckily there was, it was on the section line divided it. We didn't even have to have a survey done. So, and it was oh, on perfect. Road. Oh, it was just like, um, no I was way. like, do you see that? Yeah. My, my real estate agent, buddy, he's like, uh, yeah, it's, it's already done. I was like, perfect. So that's, but, yeah, uh, that's something for people to consider for sure. sure. Now, um, you, and granted, you, that farm needed a lot of work. Uh huh. It, it had a CRP contract that was expiring. I cleaned it up, got it re-enrolled perfect it was just like i don't know it took me three days of the brush hog had to do a little bit of spraying on some invasives and it was ready to re-enroll so but awesome. it needed it needed it needed that love you know yeah for sure yeah i, I love what? i love crp farms i'm just a crp so why, why is that yes income <laughs> well it, yeah, in, income and habitat. Like uh, you get the both, both uh, best of both worlds, and then Dude, they, I have to chase the... the quail out of my backyard. We That's cool. Covered quail. There's, I bet there's, man, I bet there's six cubbies on my farm. Like seriously. Cool. Uh-huh. Um, but and what they're doing right now, we got emergency CRP right now. Okay, so they're releasing half of every field. Okay, you just got to go to the FSA and tell them, and oh, this is what we're doing. Tell them. Yep. Yep. So they just cut 27 acres behind the east side of my house here yesterday. They're going to be bailing it this afternoon. Um, I can sell though. I'm going to keep a third of my share uh, on the bales, and I'm going to use some of them to screen my blinds. And then whatever I don't screen with, I'm going to sell them myself on Swap Shop or whatever. Yeah. You know. Um, and it's in an area where I haven't treated the Cerisia lespidiza invasives, and uh, so he's bailing up. And there's grant there's good good broadleafs and forbs out there too, but the cerisia has got, been the big problem. But it's not going to let that cerisia go to seed. Yep. And you know what I mean. And so, um, but that was a man. I was like, huh. And there's a couple sprouts out there, but he just mowed right over them. You know. So mm-hmm. really going to clean that up and save me a ton of work. 
Right. Yeah. And you get a little bit of inc- additional income off that too. Yeah. Right. That's uh yeah, that's always a, so, and just for people to understand too. So with, with the drought, this isn't something you can do every year, but it's nope. been released because of the drought. And right. So you're able to do it this year. Well, you can do it every year with a 25% penalty on your annual payment. And you can only okay. do, you can only do 75% of each designated field. Okay. Yep. That's, that's a good piece of advice. And so when you look at the, your FSA map or you look at your CRP map, just cause you have a hundred acres doesn't mean you can do uh, 75 acres of that. So if you have a 10 acre field and a 40 acre field, it's 75% of each. <clears throat> right. Oh, my hay farmer buddy was really dying to go cut my back Southeast field. It's about nine foot tall switchgrass right now, but that's not going to happen. <laughs> What's that? I wonder. He's like, dude, <laughs> you understand how many bales an acre we get off of that? It's like, you're not touching my deer nest. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. So your, your background I think it's very interesting with your upbringing, with what your dad's done for work, and then obviously what you do professionally too. So I just want to get your opinion. So I think, I think by a lot of traditional investment advisors, financial advisors, or you know, there's just a lot of opinions on this. So I just want to get your opinion. So they get beat up. Recreational ground gets beat up that it's not a real investment, and then I think that people don't understand the many income streams that can potentially come from it. And as a numbers guy and as a lender, do you see recreational land as a viable investment? Um, I, so my uncle is our CFO at the bank. And I really hope that he will take the time to listen to this. Because he, whenever I bought that farm, um, it was just, what are you doing that for? It doesn't make any money, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, we'll just see. Because I put sweat equity into that thing like you wouldn't believe. Um, but uh, I bought that farm. It was a 120-acre farm. I bought it for $2,500 an acre. In December of 16, I held it for almost three years because I had a contingent contract on this piece of dirt we're sitting on. Um, and I think I sold it for $3,500 an acre. Um, granted, I had to pay the real estate agent and did 1031 exchange. Um mm-hmm. And so my uncle is a CFO. He has to sign off on every single one of our uh, bank officer loan committees. So he's looking at these numbers and he's like, nice work. All right. All right, man. (laughs) You know? Um, And then on top of that, that farm had 30 acres of CRP. Um, Didn't pay very very good. It only paid a hundred bucks an acre. Um, It didn't do um, it. You know, all it did was pay for my food plots because I have a really bad food plot addiction. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but anyhow, that went into this farm, which it was 176 acres, uh, 149 in CRP is paying like a hundred dollars an acre. Right. When I bought it, you couldn't hardly drive your side by side through some of this because the sprouts were so bad. I put the good fireworks in, I burnt the whole thing. And did some shredding because the contract was ready, getting ready to expire the following year. Um, I took out 11 acres for food plots, uh, for food plots in my home tract. I took six acres out for my home tract. So it was paying about $15,000 a year on the old contract. We got 136 acres re-enrolled at $173 an acre. So that's about 235 my annual payment on the CRP farm is 19000 So that's making the whole payment. That's crazy. Yeah. So that was, and once I showed those numbers to my uncle on, you know, what my ROI is, he's like, okay. Granted, I worked, I had stuff, the expenses and that diesel fuel. Sure. Burning. Um, Your time. And lots of time. My wife, I love her. Uh, for staying married to me through that. And that was part, it was actually her idea to build a house out here because uh, like this morning, I was able to get up at five and work for two hours before I had to take a shower and get ready for, for uh, work and things. Um, but that's been good for um, our marriage and things. And it's just, you know, a dream come true for me. So, but yeah, getting that income to where it needed to be for this, because guess what that extra cash does? It subsidizes the payment on the timber farm. That's the race car farm. <laughs> and when you say race car farm, you doesn't mean it's pure luxury. Like uh, it's a guy that just wants a race car. I got buddies that race, okay, uh-huh. and they never make money. Okay, 
So, <laughs> I was like, how's that working out for you? <laughs> they had fun with it, and they're really sure. good fellas. Yeah, so, and everyone has their thing. I mean, that's this. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, and that's why I call it the race car farm. But is, uh, going back to that 120 acres that I bought, um, I did well on it. Um, I did well on it. The fellow that bought it it was a client and a good friend also. So, um, uh, I mean, he's enjoyed the heck out of it and I was just able to pass it on to somebody else, you know, and I did TSI projects on there that did have some cost share, made a little bit of income on that. Um, and then I sent you this attachment. I just got this this week. Oh yeah. That's the forestry management plan on the timber farm. Do you want to go into that, or do you want to talk about some tax benefits first, or what do you think? Let's let's talk about Equip and, and CSP yeah, here a little yeah. bit. Okay. Sorry, so, I got off track. No, it's all good. So I think um, this is something that such such a great tool, and I think that um, I'll just get your perspective on it. But so so what is the what is Equip? Environmental Quality Improvement Program. Uh, every county has an FSA office, and they can tell you everything about the different programs they have. My goals for mine were strictly income and improvement. There's also cost shares on tree planting programs that are not as quote unquote profitable. But um, if you're willing to do the work yourself, I mean, I'll, I'll be 35 in a couple of weeks, so I'm you know able-bodied for sure. So, um, but they, uh, just for, well, the first thing I got to do is, is have them get a get you approved for the cost share on the forestry management plan. Um, so I got approved for that. They drew up the little maps and things. I got a forester out there that they approved. He wrote the plan. Um, they're paying for the cost share on that. Usually it gets close to paying for most of it. Um, but uh, but it's sometimes that you may have to kick in a little capital for that. Uh, when I say a little capital, maybe a thousand bucks, it's three or $4,000 for them to write that plan. It takes a lot of time. It's like four, 48 pages. So it's comprehensive. Um, Very comprehensive. Oh man, there's a lot of stuff in there. Well, I haven't even been through the whole thing yet. Um, but, uh, that is well worth it when you look at the other things. I mean, you just from doing my timber burn, it'll pay, make up the difference in whatever the cost share didn't cover for the original FMP. They're paying me, uh, or anybody, on our plan anyway, or what my forester guy told me, $88 an acre just to do a prescribed fire in the timber. So on my 70 acre piece, that's almost six grand, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, and I've done a lot of prescribed fires for myself. And I got a buddy that does an excellent job, uh, run he's a food plot business. That's all he does. Mm -hmm. He plants food plots for people and prescribed burning and CRP plantings and things. Uh, and, and, you know, me and him, and I always spend four times as much time making fire breaks as what I do expect to actually be having a physical fire going. Mm. And, not, and and I got another buddy that works for the volunteer fire department out east of town here. And he actually, I've been, I've been doing prescribed fires since I was 16. So um, he kind of guided me through that. But, uh, but four times as much time putting in fire breaks as you physically do burning. And you will usually have a very safe, fire yeah that's it's a it's like when you prepare to paint laying all the tarp and taping everything off takes longer than actually painting kind of the same idea i did not paint my house because that's not me I'm not <laughs> but you'll but you'll do a prescribed burn all day every day <laughs> when the conditions are right uh that's funny right. and so i think uh in just to lay this out typically from my understanding you have to have the forestry plan on timber piece to kind of unlock all the other equip projects that you could do. Right. So on my plan, it's two years of equip, fire break, per, do the fire breaks, prescribed burn, and then let your, and I'll probably end up doing that the winter of next year, February of 20, <laughs> February of 25, probably. And I can do brush management at any time, but once you burn the timber, so I have, in certain areas of my timber, there's like 80 to 90% coverage um, from multiple rows. Mm -hmm. And after you burn it and it starts coming back up, backpack sprayer, spray it all. Yep. They're paying people, depending on the amount of coverage and what your local office does, up to like a couple hundred dollars an acre for the treatment of those that brush management stuff. 
Yep. Um, and the other big one I know in Illinois, because I've been with some buddies over in Illinois, is you know what I'm talking about, the uh, bush honeysuckle. Bush honeysuckle. I've been we have, every day after work, I've been spraying bush honeysuckle. <laughs> I'll send you my blessings and prayers. Um, <laughs> but we have it some here around the, around town, too. I got a couple permission spots around town that have it. But, uh, but yeah, so just doing that and then treating the – there's a little bit of sericea in some areas because I've got a lot of cedar thicket, okay? And uh, uh, actually, I think you can see it. Where's my mantle? There's my oh, mantle. Yeah. Did you see uh, that? I cut 32 big giant cedars off the back of my farm for the post on my patios and my mantle and my uh, a lot of the things here. It turns out my wife found out a pretty decent carpenter, so I got a lot of projects to do. But, um, but yeah, that's one thing. The first thing I did was was do that and take them to the Amish to mill out for the posts on my patio and things. But that's cool. So look at look at that. Oh yeah, because the bid from Lowe's on those posts was like fifteen thousand dollars. Just and it's just ugly western cedar, you know. Yeah. But uh, but we uh, there's all different sorts of things through the equip that you can do. But those are the main things that I'm doing. Then after you do get the equip going, CSP, which is the Conservation Stewardship Program, pays way better on crop tree release and TSI stuff. Um, TSI timber stand improvement. Everybody knows what that is. But crop tree release. So in within my cedar thickets, there's like maybe 30 acres that are completely cedar death zones. But there's little oak trees reaching from mm-hmm. the sky, little skinny mm-hmm. oak trees. And the crop tree release on those oak trees, and you know, shingle oaks, uh, a lot of bur oak on my farm, actually. Um, but go in there in an area, you know, the size of your bedroom, the size of your office, whatever it is, just to cut the cedar trees or whatever uh, other trees are around that crop tree and just let them lay and burn them up for a couple of years, whatever. And that's what the crop tree release is, and it pays really well too, depending mm-hmm. on composition and lot, there's lots of factors. They have a scoring sure. system and everything. So, but yeah, um, in, but in, yeah, the, in, buddy, the, in your consensus, in your in your drastically improving the parcel too. Where I think this is this is the frame of mind that a lot of people have is they often think, how do I extract value uh, off of this parcel? Meaning, cutting tree like doing a timber harvest when it's a little too early or maybe a lot too early. And so everyone's just thinking, how do I extract value? And then with Equip, you're getting paid to improve the parcel and it's going to be a better farm at the end of the day. I mean, so I think it's almost a, a paradigm shift to what most people naturally think. It's like, how do, I, how do I improve this versus extract? Well, and you're going to improve. So yeah, because doing that crop tree release, I mean, uh, well, I, I'll probably never sell that farm, obviously. Um, my kids might, but uh, at some point there will be ready. Some of those areas will get reforested because what it is, it's old cattle pasture, you know, but there's uh, three or four, probably 400 year old bur oaks and that are our seed trees. And there is just bur oaks just trying to survive through the cedar death, you know, and, and, and different species of oak to all kinds, but, um, but at some point, there will be able to do a timber harvest there, whether that's 30 years from now or not. I don't know if I'll see it or not. Don't really care. But it's going to improve the habitat because nothing can get through those cedars right now, man. It's just like crawling on your hands and knees. Just like I was chasing turkeys around this spring a little bit. Me and my buddy were like, this is silly. And then we yeah, just went and yeah, crawled to my way. box blind and shot our gobblers real quick. We were only there for like five minutes. <laughs> but... um yeah, that was gratifying. That's the first time I packed a turkey back to my house since this spring, so that was cool. That is that that is something special to be able to hunt out of your backyard. I think that's oh, that's the epitome of the most people. Right, certainly. So, so but yeah, yeah those, I, those things are way overlooked. Um, <clears throat> yep. On the CSP stuff, and it's just having, you know, so in some counties are better on pushing those things than others. But um, I got a pretty good crew over here. I'm in, like I said, I'm in Western Randolph County, and. And they've worked with me and communicated yeah. really well. Assembling that team, like you mentioned, uh, you got to find the resources that are wanting to help. And, 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 and maybe, and maybe for someone listening out there, maybe their County isn't that excellent. Go find someone else. like just to screen questions and maybe you can bring them ideas. And instead of asking very basic questions, like, well, from my understanding, we can, this is a possibility. What could you tell me about that? Cause it shows that you've done some research too. And I think at the end of the day, you're just dealing with people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And 
and yeah. uh, getting getting the Forester on the horn is kind of well, I think you run into a little bit of that. I think I heard on one of the other podcasts yeah. getting the Forester to get get in gear because it's it's got to like you said you got to have somebody a Forester that's passionate about that part of the business than just writing plans for giant Cause, timber harvest. Yeah, because I mean they're not it, for the amount of time that they put in. Like that's not really I imagine where their true money is made and to to go do a fifty page report and you know get the get the equip payment. So yeah, I uh, one of my farms I am waiting for a forester show up. I got equip payment for a forestry plan. I'm I'm looking at the calendar every day and I was like, man, don't I really don't want you going out there and surveying the whole farm in October or November or even September for that matter. So, uh, but it is what it is. Sure. So. Uh, so anything else on the uh, NRCS stuff or no, I think I, I would encourage anyone that owns a piece of ground to contact your local FSA on NRCS office and just at equip. You can, you can sign up whenever like those funds become available at different, at usually the beginning of the year. And like they do multiple rounds of funding, but right. you can, you can start the process now. today. Oh, one other thing I did, I did some edge feathering. Uh, so uh, I've got a couple skinny draws that run through my CRP, and I was asking about, you know, what can I do through Equip on here? They're like edge feathering. I'm like, oh, cool. I hate those trees anyway. Um, my friends will make fun of me because I'm hard on trees because I do all this TSI stuff. They're like, cut every tree down. But anyway, uh, seriously, it's called uh, so pockets like 30 by 50 foot pockets along the edge of the field line, and the FSA actually approved me to fell these in the CRP acres. Uh, of course, when I go to renew, they'll have to exclude it, but still, the rate should be higher by then. It shouldn't matter that much. Mm-hmm. But I ran, and I don't get me wrong, I've run a chainsaw a lot in my life, so I've got pretty good experience. But um, I run chainsaw for three hours, and I got a check for over $500 for that edge feathering. That's a pretty good rate. Well, <laughs> yeah, pretty good yeah. rate for your time. And oh, you're yeah, improving plus, the parts. And about three weeks later, I was running around doing a couple other things, and uh, – Guess where the cubby of quail was at? In those yeah. dead tops. So yeah. it's it's cool to see my, my pet quail. So <laughs> that's funny. And so um, something else that we haven't really talked about much, and I this is a very complex thing, and obviously people can to def- defer to their accountant. But what are some of the tax benefits that go along with recreational ground to to help make things uh, better? So disclaimer number one: I'm not qualified to give you any advice. Just what's worked for me. Um, on you, you like consult with your tax professional on that, but um, you know you want to make sure that you have a comfort level with your CPA, and they have a comfort level with what you're writing off and whatnot. Um, and you need to make sure that you have like don't be turning in Schedule F with all these expenses and it doesn't have one dollar of income. Okay, um, but uh, you need to have some sort of income, whether it's a whether it is a little bit of a timber harvest or something, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that right off when you're buying your farm. But, um, and you can also swing it as, you know, I'm, I'm trying to improve the value of my farm or whatever, just comfort level with your CPA, but, um, or accountant or whatever. But, you know, if you're using a tractor, if you're using a skid steer, if you're using even your personal vehicle, um, and you're counting your mileage for when you're uh, doing things that are farm applicable, like uh, those things are tax deductible on your Schedule F. Um, like I think seven year property on my tractor. Um, yes, I do have my zero turn for my yard because I do mow my clover and everything else with it uh, to depreciate my zero turn mower that I bought this year. Um, uh, what else on your trailers, sprayers? If you're going to have a rec farm, you should probably have a sprayer of some sort on UTV yep. or side, or or backpack spray or whatever. Depreciate that stuff. If you got a pole building, that's probably 20, 30, or 40 year property. I can't remember what mine is. Um, so like the week after I bought this place, I built a pole barn because I had to have storage. My other farm had a Connex box, um, but I was expanding rapidly with different implements and things. All your implements, um, I've got a Great Plains no-till drill that I depreciate. Um so yeah, all that stuff. Rock, don't forget rock. Yes, my driveway to my house also goes to my barn, and yes, we will depreciate rock. Um, so just things like that. If you got a grain bin, depreciate on that, and that could be your source of income too. On a third, you got a rec farm that just happened to have a grain bin. You know, um, get it rented to a local farmer. Um, 
keep all your receipts. Um, I take a picture of them, upload them to Google Drive. That way I can find them, and I'm not chasing around paper receipts. Um, uh, yeah, chainsaw blades, fuel, side-by-side fuel, whatever it is, fuel, lime, fertilizer. All Treat it as a business, basically. I mean, that's really what it is. It is. It's a, it's a real asset. It's a real thing. So, um, and as far as getting a way to get income on your farm, guess what? If you go in Missouri, uh, Missouri Department of Conservation has kind of even a streamlined uh, cost share TSI program I did on my last farm. That was income that you could, could count. So um, I didn't make a lot on it, but um, I think I did TSI on seven acres and I got like 12, 1300 bucks or something. So, um, but that's one way to justify the things that you're writing off. Tordon, oh, spent yeah. a lot of money on, spent a lot of money on Tordon that year. So, um, and remember, um, from a lending standpoint and an underwriting standpoint, on your Schedule F, even though you may post a loss, okay, depreciation and interest add back to cash flow from my underwriting standpoint. So that could put you in the green on the farm side of things instead of just people look at that net income or whatever figure at the bottom of the schedule left. Well, when it comes to underwriting, you know, if you're writing off, that's a non-cash expense, Mm -hmm. the tractor depreciation or whatever it is. So Mm -hmm. because that's money that is available to serve debt. Yeah, those are really good, really good piece of advice there. Now... I'll, I'll put you through the ringer here and I know you don't have your crystal ball. So this is just, uh, this is just fun. All right. This is just fun. This is, uh, your gut check and I'll even, I'll give, usually I just do up or down, but I'm going to add a flat option. So basically, uh, answer this and you can give a follow-up sentence or two in your mind is the rec land market going to be up, down or flat 12 months from now. So August, 2024. It's going to depend on your neighborhood and, um, I'm going to say it's at the very best case scenario, flat. Um, and worst case scenario, I think it's going to be down some, not a lot. Um, under five or under yes, ten? Five, five, yeah, under, under five or ten, I'd say. Um, because you got to remember, um, increasing demand and a very a limited supply. Okay. Yep. So that's where my head's at with that market. It, it it's going to take a dip. It, you got less buyers out there. People less people that can swing that that forty thousand dollar annual payment versus a thirty one thousand dollar payment with a four percent rate uh, eighteen months ago or whatever it was. Yep. So um, that's my prediction on the rec land values. I would encourage you to try anybody that's looking out there, man. Forty acres of timber. Yeah. Yeah. Is there income availability? Yeah. Man, try to get some CRP. Cause I'm a CRP guy or, <laughs> or some, or some, or some tillable. So, um, which, you know, it's just, you know, one of them things that, you know, it makes it easier when you have some income on the farm to write off those improvements. Cause that, that's, yeah. Opens up gold. Yeah. It's, it it's makes the 1031 it, a lot easier. <laughs> Everything. Yeah. Well, and, and you can show, well, just like this farm, man. Um, I went from like it's almost ten thousand dollars in my CRP rate change from when I bought the place, you know, and hopefully in nine more years, uh, it'll go up another forty percent on the on the price per acre for the CRP. So, um, and I got a premium rate. That may sound low to people in Southern Iowa, but that is really good for our county. Um. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but yeah, so that's just something to think about. Try and find some with some income or income potential. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so uh, jumping in your time machine here, up, down, or flat for the recreational land market in three years, so 2026. Oh, it's going to be stable. It's going to be stable. Um, it's going to be high. I mean, it's going to be stable, if not growing, in my opinion. Um, it's just going to be a factor of what what rates do to get more people that are have the ability to repay the debt on stuff like that so um and supply out there is going to be a factor too i mean we may and people that do i mean balloon loans are not something i would personally recommend but there's going to be some people out there that have some stuff balloon if rates don't actually come down in three years or whatever it is 
um, and you're like, man, that's not something that I want to be getting into with if rates are haven't gone down or they were yeah. counting on rates going down. Sure. Yeah. So um, that's just my personal preference. It might be right for some more other people, whatever. If they're planning on paying it off before the balloon, great. So, um, yeah, I would rather fully amortize a note personally. Mm-hmm. Okay. And would you the same, same answer for the next five years then? Oh, five years. Ugh. Yeah. That's post-election year. Um, <laughs> and, th- and so is three, I guess, but yeah, it's going to ride a lot on the election. I mean, it just, it just, it is. That's it. If you're going to have a, a, a pro economy administration, uh, like, you know, I don't, I don't talk politics or religion a lot of times, but you know, the, the, the Republican party is going to be more apt to growth and, and, and to enrich in the middle class. You know what I mean? That's just the pattern of practice. That's just the facts. So, Mm -hmm. um, and, and the other side is going to probably detract from that in my opinion, they want to shrink the middle class. That's, Long story short, I'm sure Skip could get into that too. Me and Skip <laughs> have lots. Of, me and Skip have had some conversations about that. You want to get him fired up? Talk yeah. politics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Um, what about um, what about interest rates here? This is a. I think you have a little bit better pulse than most people on this. But interest rates in the next twelve months, do you think they're going to be up, down, flat? I'm going to go with I'm going to go with flat because I don't see. Them, I see them going up a little before they're going to go down, uh, or they may be flat here in September, uh, based, based on what I've read. And I think it's going to take longer for them to go down than what people are hoping for the yeah. bill in the next year for on the real. So yeah, yeah. but they but, may. And the other side of that is if if the current uh, political administration is looking for votes, they may have some influence there somewhere to, to make drop. them go down. Yeah. Yeah. You I mean, know, that's a double, you know that's that a double edged sword there. If they're trying to fight inflation, then they end up dropping them. And then there's a, 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 a flurry of uh, more buyers again. And then inflate, I mean, there was, uh, I listened to this somewhere and it was such a good, such a good way to describe it. It's like the economy is on uppers and downers. It's like, all right, well, all right. You, uh, you need to, you need to get ramped up here. Oh, not that much. All right. We'll take this now. All right, cool. And it's such a vicious cycle. One extreme to the other, man, just like commodity prices, man. Um, and I'm not, uh, I'm not a, a traditional ag lender by any means or claim to be, but, uh, there's a lot of them in my, in our bank and my colleagues at the bank that that's their bread and butter every day. It's not mine, but, uh, you know, corn and bean prices are going to, I don't, I mean, that's the, we want to talk more stability in land investment, row crop, mm-hmm. that, sure. that kind of thing on, and, and, uh, that's just my opinion. So. Yeah, I think that, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's fair. A lot more competition, I think though. I mean, I think that sometimes people feel like there's a lot of competition in recreational ground, but even uh, like till row crop tillable, I mean, there's so much, a lot of money that's getting uh, infused into that whole space. I mean, uh, more money than we can even imagine. Yeah, because you've got, you know, people moving out of the stock market, you know, um, and I'll turn and, and people are doing, you've heard of REITs, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, the, the REITs are still, you know, they've been popular for a while, but they're becoming a little bit more popular. Um, it's not my area of expertise and don't claim for it to be, but that's real estate in the, in the ag market. We're seeing a lot of people that are buying ag farms just because there's, you know, limited supply, like I say. And there's mouths to feed. That's a real thing. So, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, uh, what about interest rates in the next three years? So now we're getting, you know, post election once again. But by then, what are your thoughts? Are they, are they down from where they're at right here today? I would say they're down from where they're at today. I would have to think. Yeah. So, especially if we have an administration change. Uh-huh. So, okay. And then what about five years? So now we're looking at about half a decade. I don't know how anyone could predict five years from now, but I hope so. I'd sure like to, I'd sure like to save four or $500 off my mortgage. Heck yeah. Um, yeah, they, I would, I would think that they would be somewhat back to a norm. You know, we may not see prime rate at, at you know, 4%, but I think we'll see five. Sure. So, yeah. 
it's going to be gradual, man. It's just going to take some healing from all this inflation stuff. It's just crazy. It's bananas. So, yeah. if, if I could, uh, if I could have, you know, shook my magical wand, they should have just raised rates sooner and more aggressively instead of just prolonging pain. Oh yeah, I mean, shock. It would have been better to shock and all. I mean, it just yeah. would have four uh, to seven. Everything's you know everything stalls instead of do, 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 do. and. People are way smarter than me, so this is just a, a dumb guy from Illinois. Share my opinion here. Same man. I may be a banker um, in my day in my day to day, but um, and, and I do enjoy it because I get the relationships and, and do and finance a lot of farms for people and stuff. But um, but uh, you know, my heart and soul is with my family and, my, and the dirt here that I'm on. You know, so um, and big shout out to my wife Heather for putting up with me and every all the thing crazy things that I like to do. She's like, why you got them cutting hay? I'm like, well, I want some hay bales. She's like, oh, what, what for? I was like, oh, to screen my blinds so the deer can't see me coming in and out of them. It's like, oh, makes sense. Yeah, like, I, I, I think. That, yeah, I think that's such an important thing, and that's something I've noticed with a lot of different people I talk about is like having uh, the full household on the same page, or at least, uh, or at least can understand where the other one's coming from. And I mean, that could be inversely too for someone that's really bullish on all this, and and maybe there's significant others, the exact opposite. Like, I think there's got to be communication and balance there. And that's just based off a lot of people I've talked to because it, it seems to be a really important part of this whole process. Right. No. And, and, and she's a team player and it was awesome when the, my son's obsessed with tractors. He'll be two in November and they're out there going back and forth, cutting hay and he was just losing it, man. Wow. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's just fun being able to, to well, that's when I was a kid. I grew up in town. It was more related. It was just like, you know, 15,000 people or whatever it is. Um, and I was just like, man, mom and dad, they're talking about buying a different houses. Like, can we just get out of town, be in the country so I can go do all the shoot my guns, my bows, yeah. and do all the things, all the things, man. And and uh, getting out here is just a dream come true. So it's just been a, a whirlwind and a lot of debt, but a lot of, and a, but a lot of, a lot of fun when I'm just able here to, to, uh, you know, be able to slip out of an evening or whatever, just behind the house. So has there been, has there been a point in your, uh, up to your point in uh, life now to where you were overstressed with the debt that you carried to where like, uh, I'm, I'm getting in over my head or I'm nervous or I'm definitely, I'm definitely done for a while. So, um, am I nervous? No, because I've, you know, I could always, if worst came to worse, I could, I could sell something, but, uh, I don't see that happening or find alternative streams of income like this, like this, uh, uh, timber management plan or, and, and stuff. It's just, that's where, cause I, I fully intend on taking all that money and throwing it down on principle. Mm-hmm. Um, because my, my end goal is to have enough equity in my farm here to get an inventory, uh, note so I can do some more investing. So mm-hmm. that's kind of my, that's kind of my end goal. And you're right, I've got good equity in the farm, but it's just kind of one of those things where um, if I had to sit on a, a, an investment piece for a little while, making the interest payment right now, it would not be healthy for my, for my balance sheet. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, yeah. So if I, if I were to set up a half million dollar line of credit behind my equity or whatever it is, um, do that math. You don't want to look at it. It's not pretty. So, yeah. um, I wouldn't even tempt myself with that, but right now I'm, I'm in buy and hold mode. I got, uh, I think the highest rate I paid on that most recent 40 was, was 5%. Um, and that was the one that was on a five year arm, but, um, everything else is from, uh, 3.2 to four, seven, I think. Mm-hmm. So, but that's, that's kind of where I'm at on, on some of that stuff, which, you know, people say, wish you would have bought more, but that was just right for my level of risk and tolerance, you know? Yeah. Which is a big thing. I, I catch myself doing that too. Like, man, I wish I would have bought more when rates were 3%, mm-hmm. but it's like, well, I, I bought what I could afford and that was the right decision. And you know, there'll be more opportunities. I, and that's the other thing too, is like most of these guys that have a lot of experience, like they always have an abundance mindset. Like there's always going to be more opportunities. There's always going to be more things. Uh, the market works in cycles. Like it, sure. you just, you just live and learn as simple as that sounds. Certainly. So, well, we're we'll have, we're gonna have to have you back on for the Missouri regulations because this this was a really really great conversation, right. and I want to talk about what you have going on there. And uh, that's what that's what kind of got us going on this podcast idea. It's like, hey, we ought to talk about finance. It's like, 
well, we're going to live in finance today. So, well, finance, <laughs> and that's just, and it's not just finance, man. This is a whole, it's, it's a, it's a culture and a choice that people make for, uh, an investment for their lifestyle and their family. And, and you know what, if, uh, when I'm dead and gone and they're carrying me out of here feet first and my kids want to sell this farm, they'll have a really solid asset to, you know, if they want to, or, and I pray to God that that's not the case and they want to continue to enjoy it and be a generational thing. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, um, but, uh, but it's, it's something that I encourage everybody. If you're have any sort of outdoor being or want to do more than just golf and fish to, uh, to check it out, put at least look at, put your about you, you should be putting your household balance sheet together annually at the very minimum anyway, to see where you're at on everything. Yeah. Um, and, and financial and, and that's, you know, Unfortunately, I do refinances on homes for divorce, and because guess what, the number one reason for divorce is finance, and you know it's it's a healthy thing for any marriage or relationship, and and uh, whether you're buying a farm or not, so just do that for yourself and your household, and know where you're at. Yeah, that's that's a great piece of advice. Well, if someone uh, wants to reach out to you and ask you some more questions, I know you can lend across the Midwest or you know all fifty states. So if someone wanted to, oh yeah, see what kind of loan products yeah. you guys have, how should they reach out to you? Yeah, you can uh, catch me on my email at uh, Joseph J O S E P H C like Charlie at Regional M O dot Bank. It's Joseph C at Regional M O dot Bank. So that's my email. I'm in the Morley, Missouri office and. Uh, Love to, you know, have an opportunity to meet with anybody um, on finance and a farm, and the best way to do it for your family. And if we need to pump in a hybrid hybrid loan schedule or anything like that, there's options out there. Or at the very least, put a plan together with that uh, financial statement and go ahead and crunch some numbers from the tax returns and debt service coverage stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll put your email in the description. And I want to thank you again for for taking the time out of your day. A really great conversation and. Uh, I'm excited to hear how your fall goes and what are the projects you get into. We've got a couple uh, targets acquired, so we'll see how time. we'll see how you and I'll stay up to uh, keeping pair notes on that and uh, and then maybe get in this QD and regs for Mo thing on a later episode because that's something that I'm passionate about and yeah, uh, so many things. That, I, I, I take I'm on looking so forward to that too. Things. I take on well, so many things. My wife's like, "What are you doing now?" <laughs> <laughs> I think some people are just wired that way and that's just the way it is. Uh, but it, I think uh, you're, you're on a path that's, that's worthwhile. And I want to, I definitely want to dive into it and uh, hopefully some people that will resonate with it and maybe throw their hat in the ring and, and help do some of the lifting for you too. We need to get it out. Of, we need to get it out there. Um, I've got a pretty good group put together, but it needs to, it needs to be something that, you know, people, anybody that hunts in Missouri should be in favor of this, this stuff that we're working on. So, but, um, but we'll talk about that another day. I don't want to keep you on here too long. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much once again. And, uh, um, we'll, we'll get you back on here before long. Cool. Sounds great, Mr. Jake. Thank you, sir.